so I heard a lot from you and stuff. So I'm going to introduce myself so you know. So with my background, I am, the first thing I will say is that I am certified. So there are other assessments out there and some people can do them online, they can do whatever. Um, I'm the real deal. I've been trained and certified. I work um, certified with Thomas International, which is one of the largest uh, assessment companies in the world. They are, as I said, international. They are in 60 countries and 56 languages. So they are massive and huge. And again, the reports and stuff we can do, we can have them done in different languages too, which is really handy. Um, so one of the things I always like to mention right away, because when you get certified, you kind of, you take it over confidentiality. So going forward, if we're ever working on people's profiles, doing sensitive stuff, just so you know, it's confidential. That's the oath that I've taken. It's a human rights commission issue. And so uh, for sure, everything that we talk about will always be private and confidential. I just want you to know that going forward. Um, so basically I worked at Royal LePage at the head office for the past five years. And this is where I started to get my certification. We were helping some of the brokerages in terms of hiring and uh, working with their teams, a lot of big agent teams forming and needing some guidance around doing that. So that's where it started for me. And I just, uh, once I really started to understand it, I just became super passionate about it because I feel very, very firmly. I've seen the results, the results are amazing. And I just decided this is what I want to be doing full time. So uh, I opened up, started my own business doing it full time. Majority of my clients are in the real estate industry. I'm a preferred supplier of Royal Page, so I do a lot of stuff for Royal Page. Um, and also, just so you know, uh, I, I'm not just coming into it as as just a, an analyst. I have walked the walk. So I was a licensed realtor. I was on a chairman's club team, and uh, so I I am very familiar with that. Again, in high school and university, I used to work uh, at the, on the reception desk, which I will tell everyone was the best education in real estate that you could ever get. I learned more doing that than I did when I was getting my license. Um, because when you're that person and night times and weekends, you're doing everything. So you're doing the phones, you're doing the appointments, you're doing offers, CMAs. So, so I really, I really have a very extensive real estate background. So the nice thing about that is I know that it's not a normal, typical industry. So uh, the hiring choices, hours, the expectations, it's very, very different from your from your typical kind of business. So um, so I just want you to know that I, uh, I, I speak your language in terms of all of that. So what I always like to start my workshops off when I do um, is, is to talk about the study that they did at MIT because I really want you all to really realize how important communication, effective communication is. And a lot of the problems on teams you'll see is people misunderstanding each other, uh, thinking somebody's being mean to them or they're singling them out. And what you're gonna learn is that, in fact, it's just people's different workplace styles, the way that people are comfortable working. And when people understand that, it depersonalizes issues and it really is, a, it really is an eye opener. So at MIT, and this was published in the Harvard Business Review, so they studied communication and they looked at all kinds of factors. So they looked at education. So maybe someone had an MBA. They looked at intelligence. They looked at the skills. They looked at all of this stuff. They combined all of those together and even still that wasn't as important as patterns of communication. Number one predictor of a successful team is the patterns of communication. Really want you to remember that because, you know, often leaders and stuff, they'll think, oh, this is nice. It's a feel good session. It's whatever. That usually makes them sit up in their seats. No, <laughs> this, this is really important. So what they did in that study is they, they actually outfitted people with these little sensors that they had. And so they were able to watch their interactions and watch teams that maybe emailed each other, had very quick interactions, did what have you. And then they looked at teams that would kind of lean in, talk to each other, had the meeting. And so, you know, like I said, with all the factors combined, the most important predictor was, was the pattern of communication. So, Hugely, hugely big message there. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna have a little bit of fun. I wanna know, first of all, how many of you have ever done a disc profile? How did you how'd yourself? You have? Okay. The rest of you, I'm assuming, have not. And so the thing is, coming into this, you know, you haven't done your own assessment. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a really quick, fun little exercise, which is gonna give you a probable idea of what your disc is. Now, it's not gonna be the same as doing a full assessment, but it's gonna give you an idea. So you all have a piece of paper in front of you. So you've got highlighters as well. So I'd like you to take a look at your paper and have a look at all these behavioral descriptive words. 
And without putting too, too much thought into it, I want you to highlight the words that you feel describe you the best. And what I always say is think of yourself in the workplace environment when you're answering this, okay? So think of yourself at work and how you prefer to behave. So don't overthink it, just go with your gut, have a look at the words and just highlight the ones that you feel most accurately describe you, okay? I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to do this. Don't overthink it guys, this is fun. <laughs> hesitating and you had a reaction right away like yeah that's me go with always go with your with your gut and that's why I always tell people when they're doing the actual assessment online as I say if you have that first gut feeling then you go with that and you don't overthink it Mostly everyone had a chance to finish. Don't agonize. If you really have to think about it and you're not sure, then I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, highlight it. If you, if you had a strong reaction to it, you probably would have highlighted it right off the bat, okay? So once everyone has finished that, what I want you to do is you take your piece of paper here and I want you to fold it into four. Don't worry if it's not perfectly on the line. So you're gonna fold it one way in half take it, you're going to fold it this way, and then you're going to fold it again this way. You didn't know you were coming for arts and crafts, did you? Okay, so basically what it's going to give you is four quadrants when you folded it. And if, you're, if your fold didn't get right on the line, you can just have a look because you can count and see how many there are there, right? One, two, three, four, five, and then you're going to do the rest of them. So basically you've got these four quadrants of, right? So now what I want you to do in this corner here, the one that starts with decisive, I want you to write the letter D beside that. Okay, so this whole quadrant right up here, we're gonna write D. And then you're gonna move to the next quadrant that starts with the entertaining and optimistic, and you're gonna write the letter I beside that. The next one, the one at the bottom, that starts that the cutoff part where we start at the um, low key and the worrier part, we're going to put S. So right here, you're going to do an S. And then over here in this quadrant where we've got precise, we're going to put a C. Okay, did everyone get that? So now what I would like you to do is <laughs> I'd like you to look at your highlights and the area that you had the most highlights in, that's going to be your dominant factor. That's going to be the one that you have the most. So I'd like you to find what that is and circle it. So count them up, the one, the corner that has the most, and then you will likely have another one that's pretty close to, and then that will be your next one, okay? And you can, you can rank them as they go down. So what your highest one was, what your next highest one was, and so on and so forth. And if you have a tie, you can you can let me know too if you have a tie. And that's not a, that's not unusual either. Yes, you have a tie. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that happens because as you'll see, and I'll talk about this, it's very it's it's not that common to have just one high factor. Most of us have two, maybe even three high factors. So what I always tell people is um, if you look at the population, 50% of the population has two high factors over two low factors. The other 25% has three high factors over one low factor. And again, the other 25% got one over three. So we all are a mix of all of these things. So let me know if everybody, has everybody managed to uh, count up and see, give themselves a, a, a good estimate of what their dominant ones are? Yes? Okay, so just, just for fun, 
how many people had the most in D? Raise your hand. Okay. How many people had the most in I? Yeah. How many people had the most in S? And how many had the most in C? Yeah. C is all tied. I'll tell you, it's tied. Okay. C, that's very, so honestly, that's, pr that's pretty predictable. Uh, C is usually, especially in this industry, uh, on, the, on the smaller side. And, and, you know, we'll see why. And did, so speaking of that, though, so those of you that have the D or have the I, did you have a very close sort of tie situation? Yes. D and I, exactly the same. Exactly the same. Yes. So that's quite, that's quite common, too. Okay. Yes. And you'll and you will see that in the industry. We're gonna we're gonna move on. So so the reason I wanted you to do that is to give you kind of a sense when we're talking about disc and what it means. Now I mean, I, this is not by any means gonna replace a proper assessment, but it'll just let you be sort of connected to your factor when we talk about it and have some understanding of what that is. Okay. Okay. So so just a quick um, overview of disc so you understand it. So DISC is the most widely used behavioral assessment model in the world. There are other assessment models, but uh, DISC is by far the one that's most prevalent. It was um, first introduced in 1928, and we're still using it. It's been, it's been modified, of course, over the years. But with some of the other assessments, um, they are, they're, they're just general personality or they're what have you, but they don't focus on the workplace. So the great thing about DISC was DISC was designed specifically for people's workplace behaviors. And that's the key to it. And so again, I said it was 1928, and it was developed by a man, Dr. William Marston. This guy was super smart and creative. He is most well known for inventing the lie detector test. So the polygraph, that was courtesy of him. So I find, I find that really interesting, <laughs> considering uh, that when people do these assessments, they're like, oh my gosh, I did this for 10 minutes. How does this thing know me so well? And another really interesting uh, thing about this guy is he is the one who wrote the original comic book version of Wonder Woman. So does anyone know what Wonder Woman's superpower is? Well, she has her, when she lassoes people, and what happens to the people when they do that? They have to, it compels them to tell the truth. So very, I find that's a very interesting correlation. And that'll just tell you too about how precise and accurate, uh, how accurate the disc is. So again, very, very important tool. So I'm gonna go through the factors, again, high level, because you know we don't have a full, a full day on a, on a seminar about this, but I just want you to have some understanding. So, so starting with D, D does stand for dominance, which sometimes can sound a little bit harsh, depending on how you're looking at it. But you know, so the descriptive words for this, they're people who are preference in D are very driving, competitive, assertive, you will find that a lot of leaders uh, in, in businesses and stuff like that have a high D in their profile. Not always, the, not, it's not always the leading factor, but there is definitely usually a high D somewhere in there. Um, tell me what you think about the figure up there. What, what are you taking from his body language? What's the overall opinion of that? Telling someone what to do. Uh-huh, okay. Anyone else have a stronger reaction or? Less of a reaction? Pardon? Don't do, okay. So some of you are saying demanding and maybe seen as aggressive, whereas what's interesting, and it often depends on your profile, other people will actually just see it as, well, he, he's just to the point, he's passionate, he's, so often with D's, like there's observable behaviors. Somebody's having a good laugh here. <laughs> Is it hitting close to home? Uh, so often you will see uh, high D's that they are demonstrative in those things. So sometimes, you know, and it's not even a conscious thing with them, but it's just like, and this is, and we're going to do this, and often to emphasize, and and, and I went there, and this is what, it, and, it, and you know, to someone who's not maybe, maybe wired that way, they might be a little bit like, oh. So this is the whole beauty about understanding people's disc profiles. A lot of people might take that the wrong way, whereas when you understand where that person is coming from, you see, no, no, that's just a direct behavior. That person is just looking for the results and the, you know, the end goal. And so, you know, th there are some observable behaviors that sometimes you will see, you know, they may interrupt and they may be kind of challenging and, and things like that. And so that's, that's the, with the way the high D looks. With the low D behavior, low D behavior, of course, is going to be pretty opposite to that. So it's very consultative 
and cautious and non-demanding. And, and so obviously that's gonna look very different to the high D. So what I do when I'm doing my, my team workshops is I, I like to explain, and I just wanna clarify this, just because your factor is low, a low factor doesn't mean it's bad. So high doesn't mean good and low doesn't mean bad, okay? So I do want you to understand that. The high factors are what are obvious. It's on the table, that's what people see. The low factors are your supporting factors. So normally what I do, and I think, I don't think we have any of this, but excuse my, I'm gonna do a little crude drawing of the tree here. I wasn't good at art, so forgive me. Um, okay, so the leaves on a tree, very visible to everyone, right? Those are your high factors. That's what people see, that's what's obvious, but Would that tree exist if it didn't have the roots underneath it to support it and to help it grow? It would not. So that's how I like to compare the high factors and the low factors, if you think of that tree. Your low factors are not bad factors, they're supporting your high factors. Your high factors are the leaves that everybody looks and sees, okay? The other thing I like to say with people when we look at these figures and people think, oh, that guy looks really mean or he looks aggressive, I like to say, Behavior sometimes is very important to the situation that you're in. It's very relative. So let's say you were trapped in a submarine and this is the guy that knew the way out versus somebody else that was there and was sitting maybe like this and was like, you know, I'm pretty sure I know the way out. I think I saw a map versus this guy who's like, I know the way out. Do we all of a sudden see that behavior a little differently? And are we going to follow this person? Or are we going to follow that person? We're going to follow, we're going to follow that, right? So I like to point out behaviors relative to situations. It's not all good. It's not all bad. So Again, if you know high Ds in your life or people you suspect to be high Ds, you can, you can have that understanding that that's just the way they're working. They're direct. They want to get to the point. Um, they don't want to waste a lot of time on idle chit chat. Let's just get to it. And again, we are talking about work behavior, right? Okay, so I'm going to give you some examples of some celebrities that we know <laughs> that, might, uh, that, are, that are high Ds, just to bring it home. Okay, so obviously we've got, got some demonstrative stuff. Do we, does everyone know who's up, first of all, just to make sure? So we've got Simon Cowell. Uh, I feel like he's become a lot, I think his D's gone down a bit since he's become a father. He seems a lot nicer. <laughs> but if you think of him back on American Idol days, it was like, wow, what, he was to the point, right? And the interesting thing was he didn't think, he wasn't out there for sport to be mean. He, if, you ask, if, if people questioned him, he'd say, but they're here for help. They're here to know if they're going to make it. They want to know. So I'm just giving them an answer. And that, that's what it was. That's what D's all about. Hey, this is this is the goal. This is what I want to give them. So, and of course we've got Madonna, and we've got up there we've got uh, Serena Williams. Of course, very focused, driven, champion. She got the number one up there. So again, very very D like behavior. So after D, we move on. We have I, and that stands for influence. And this one is a good one, especially I feel like there's going to be a lot of people in this room that can relate. So I, if we have a word to describe I, it's sell or persuade. And I can tell you from my uh, experience in the real estate industry and from studies that Thomas International has done, disproportionately, salespeople are high in I. If they could pinpoint one factor that everyone in sales has in common, it's this. And doesn't that make sense? Because look at it. It's about people. Eyes love to connect with people. They're able to be charismatic. They're able to persuade. That's what I is great at. So a lot of you probably are eyes. A lot of the people in the industry that you deal with are eyes. And eyes are, you know, like I mentioned, they're, they love to talk to people. They're verbal, they're communicative, they're persuasive. And I, I, do, I do another workshop um, that's when, you know, I just, I run it for, for agents and what it's called is speed reading your clients because you can't go to your client and say, hey, can you do a disc assessment? That'd be great, but that's not likely. But what I say is, you know, you can do this thing where you can speed read their behaviors and so with eyes, eyes are kind of dead giveaways because eyes are the people that are, you know, you might see them and they're in a car and nobody's even there, but they're, they're talking and they're, you know, they're gesturing and they're doing a lot of that. And, you know, um, when they're talking to you, they're leaning in. Like if you see this figure, you see the body language is different, right? She's, it's also very, it's demonstrative like the D was. It was a very outward showing behavior. But where the D kind of, you know, a lot of you felt the D looked more aggressive. This is very much open, isn't it? It's very much like, talking, I'm open, and, and often with eyes, you can, like I said, they're quite easy to speed read. Very chatty, love to talk, love to talk a lot. <laughs> Lots of hand motions going on. So 
you're ever trying to speed read your clients, that's one of the things I, I say, and I even tell people, put it in your CRM, you know, put it right in there. I think this person's a high eye. So instead of maybe sending them an email, I'm going to pick up the phone, I'm going to talk to them, or maybe I'm going to meet them for coffee and have that conversation in person, because I love that connection. They want that personal connection. They thrive on it. Okay. So that's a lot of what I is about. And then, of course, the flip side of I is, you know, more logical and serious and reflective kinds of behavior. It's more about the task versus people, whereas I is all about connecting with people. So I think you can see why real estate is obviously a, a great industry for, for people that are, that are high in I. That's not to say you have to have a high I, by the way. Everyone has different approaches. It just tends to draw people who are naturally doing that. Uh, Thomas International, the company I'm certified with, did a... Um, a survey of 20,000 sales reps. It wasn't just real estate, 20,000 sales reps uh, in North America and disproportionately the highest factor was I, followed by D. But, but uh, I mean, it, we can safely say that. So you're, it's good for you to be aware of this one because probably a lot of the people you're dealing with have this. And so let's have some examples of people. So who are high in I, so people who like to be charismatic, who persuade, who reach a lot of people, okay? So, despite how anyone feels about things politically. <laughs> Nonetheless, these, these, are definitely, uh, these are definitely examples of I. So moving along the model, we move to steadiness. So that's what S is. S stands for steadiness. And, um, you know, S's are fantastic listeners. S's are very thorough, dependable. They're great team players. So definitely would love, you know, you'd kind of love to have an S or two on your team because they really, um, connect with a the team, they like that team atmosphere, they want to be supportive, they want to help each other. Like I said, they're great listeners. So S's are often great managers, um, you know, just in terms of helping people out, listening, supporting, uh, very thorough. So you give an S a job and they may not get at it right away. We'll talk about the difference between high S and low S. However, they will follow it through. S's are the people that are going to follow through on tasks. So if you want somebody to follow through on stuff, you're going to, you're going to be looking at a high S. And you'll notice that the, um, the picture of this is they've chosen a medical professional and the body language is kind of neutral and the head's kind of tilting. It's harder to speed read S's and C's, you'll see, because the D and the I, we had a lot more of this. S's are pretty reserved and C's even more so. But I can tell you again, if we look at studies done, you know, so GP, your general practitioner, your doctor would likely be an S. Not surgeons, that's a whole different thing. But but your like your family doctor and also teachers. There's a huge, huge amount of teachers that are that are high in S. And it makes sense again, right? That team atmosphere, listening, helping. S is really like to help. So a low S, when you move away from the high S, the low S people are very, very fast paced, multitasking. They prefer to work at a quicker pace. They're kind of like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Whereas someone high in S is like, let me focus on this, and now I'm gonna move on to this. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it right, and then I'm gonna move along. Okay, whereas low S is more about getting a lot of it done, getting it done quickly. So when I do my workshops, I like to do this little exercise S is very much about pace, as I talked about. So I, well, my apologies. No, no problem. Does anyone have a white uh, Mercedes SUV BYZ at six four seven? Yes. <laughs> no. Yes. Is this done? Wait, it is you. Your voice is on me. I'm sorry, but they can't get up. My apologies. I'm done after this. I don't know. I think it's harder from there than. Yeah, that's more scary. Just kidding. Yeah, it's a little. Okay, I could put it smaller. No. Okay. Okay. So one of the things um, that I like to do, like I said, with S, is uh, I like to show how the pace is different of S. So one of the things that we do in the workshops is I get everyone to drum out their natural pace. So some people like to work at a, like I said, high S. It's usually like a, like tick tock, tick tock. Some people are like da 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 da, -da. and other people are just this way, this way, this way. So what we're gonna do? We're gonna do fun little exercise again. So I'm gonna count you down from three, two, one, and everyone's gonna go. So here's a pace, okay? Here's a pace. Uh, you could have a. Or you could have this. Now remember, this is not what you have to do because some of us, like, you know, we have days where we have to do that. But what I want to know is 
the pace that you feel like the most natural, you're comfortable, you're happy working at. <clears throat> okay? So we're all going to do this in three, two, one, go. Have, yeah, have a look around too. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So often when I'm doing teams and it's, you know, um, usually like, I, I don't know, probably the most I've done is maybe 10 on a team. And there was one team that I did that there were six of them. And one of the girls was the only one on the team that had a low S. She said to me, oh my gosh, Victoria, if there was one thing I took away from that workshop, she said it was that because she was looking around at her team thinking, what do you guys do? Like, they're like doing this. And she's like, duh, 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 duh. and they were looking at her like, but she said that was a light bulb moment because she was always like, what's going on? Why can't we get this done? Like, she just couldn't really understand it. Once she understood what S is about, they're thorough. Like, they're not going to take it on and just get it done. They're going to do it. They're going to think about it. They're going to do it right. And with her, she was just like, I want to keep going. And she just said to me, wow, that completely changed it and as many times as i've done it it's it, it really is remarkable how how accurate that that pacing is it really is so I, we, we always like to do that and have a bit of fun with it but it, it definitely uh it definitely indicates what your s is like so some examples of s so we've got mother Teresa, who of course was very was a very kind and and philanthropic woman devoted her life to charity and helping people Ellen's a good example of that. I don't know if any of you will like watch her show, but she's, you know, she's very much about, you know, helping people, doing fun things for people, but she's very, has that very supportive ear and was great in her own life about sharing some of the personal things that she went with to be an example. And I don't know if you know who this is, but it's, it's Clara Hughes and she um, is an Olympian and she was kind of one of the first ones to come forward and she partnered up with the Bell to do the thing. So she talked a lot about having, um, having bring mental illness to the to the forefront and to talk about it and to be that support for people who maybe felt that it wasn't okay to talk about it so that's a lot of what s is about if anyone has any questions about the factors as i'm going along please please stop and ask if you need clarification okay okay and so now finally we're at our fourth factor which is compliance so that's what c stands for and so with c i find the compliance, it kind of goes both ways. So other C words that you would use to kind of um, use it in, as well as compliance would be very correct, careful, cautious, those kinds of words. So people who are high in C are very much about getting the details right. Um, focused on details, focused on a set uh, of rules and policies and guidelines. So there might be somebody where you say, oh, let's do this. Oh, no, no, this is, this is the way we've done things. This is the protocol. This is what we're doing. I find that some people with, with C, it, it kind of splinters two ways. Um, some people have both of these ways and some people are one or the other. So the one way it goes is very perfectionistic. So detail, like checking things, making sure everything's right, you know, having all of that information. Uh, and the other way is somebody who really is a stickler for rules because um, I used to work with somebody that uh, had a high C. And at first I couldn't understand it because, you know, often the emails would go out, there'd be mistakes. And I'm thinking, how are you a high C? Because there's these mistakes that that person was a lot more about following rules and protocols. And it was like, no, this is the way it is. We're going to follow this. So it's kind of, you can have both of it or you can have one or the other, but that's what C is about. And, you know, even this figure, you can look and you can see that it's, it's not, it's, you can see what I mean about not being obvious to speed read like the other one. So this person is very kind of engaged in their task. Uh, very much that C is all about the task, the work, where we talked about eyes, where they're very people focused and wanting to engage and have those conversations. C's are not like that. C's are more uh, about the task. Let's focus on the task. Let me make sure this is right. Let me get uh, all my information gathered before I give you an answer on that. Whereas an I could probably say something very confidently and a D and maybe not put a lot of research or thought into it and can pull it off. Whereas a C, a C wouldn't do that. A C is like, I am going to have my information right. I'm going to know what I'm doing. And then, then I'm going to answer your question. It's going to be the right answer. Uh, so, so that's a lot about what C is like. And so the opposite with low C, we get very much, um, you know, independent, strong willed, firm behavior, um, you know, obviously not necessarily needing to follow rules. And, and, you know, often we'll see, We'll see people with that with that low C behavior um, in real estate. <laughs> You'll see that a lot. And uh, again, it's just a matter of how those how those factors balance each other. But 
and you can see the little word there, play it safe for C. So always wanting to be right, make the right decision, have the facts and information. So, you know, when we're talking about speed reading people, the C's are probably going to be like your clients that you have to show them maybe 30, 50 houses and they might, oh, do you, do you like it? Do you, oh, do you like this house? And you're not going to get a, you're not going to get like an obvious reaction, right? Some of you are nodding like, yeah, I know I have some of these people. So you're not going to get that obvious reaction and they might be like writing, they'll probably be writing it down or they'll pull out like their, uh, their, their iPad and they'll have a spreadsheet and they'll be like, right? So, so, and you'll be like, oh, do you like it? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to just look and see how it balances out. Whereas with, with an eye client that you're going through, they, they could walk in and like in two minutes be like, I love it. I feel it in my bones. This is the house for me. Lots of these kinds of things. Those are going to be your eye clients. So, so with your C clients, that's definitely going to be a whole different ballgame. And you're going to want to make sure for them that you know your stuff, you follow up with information. You're always sending in, you know, attachments with the listing, with all the information in there, because C's are going to want to know that. I's will probably be like, okay, no, what, what, did you like it? Do you think I'll like it? Okay, great. <laughs> so, you know, really important to understand where people are coming from to, to know that. So let's see some examples of some C's. So Bill Gates. David Suzuki, the scientist, um, very, C's are very, very, you know, often very, very intelligent, very creative people. And so those two are the examples of that. I, does, does anyone watch The Crown? It's about the queen. Okay, it's on, I think it's on Netflix. So anyway, this is, this is actually not the queen, but this is Claire Foy who plays the queen. And I think they did a great depiction of that because, you know, you kind of, it shows you in her early life and how she basically had to not choose things as yourself anymore. It was the crown and everything is about what that crown represents. So I'm choosing this on behalf of, I'm the monarch. You know, there was family situations that perhaps she wanted to do something different and because she's representing the, mon the crown, she did it. So that shows you that strict adherence to a set of guidelines and protocols. She's a good example of seeing that. Okay, so we're gonna have some fun with this. We're gonna see what we learned about that. I know it was a quick little snapshot, but Hopefully everyone is familiar with the original Star Wars, yes? So the original Star Wars movies back, back how many years ago? I don't want to say, but you know the original cast, like Luke Skywalker, those people? Yes, yes. Can we think of anyone in that original series who might represent D? So very, think of D again, very dominant, authoritative, direct behavior, intimidating to some people. Yes, you got it. <laughs> Darth Vader, okay. So now let's think about I. So I, we're going with the person who would be good at sales, who's charismatic, who's, you got it, Han Solo, you guys are, you guys up front. Very good, okay? Um, so now we're gonna go on to S, and I'll give you a little bit of a hint with this. If you're ever watching a TV show, a movie, the star, the star of the movie, the star of the show kind of thing is usually always the S, because we talked about S being very steady, being likable, being that amiable kind of person the person that sort of everybody can relate to. So do, who do we think is the S in this case? Who is, who is one of the main characters in the main one? Luke. Yes, exactly. Luke Skywalker. Okay, and now we're gonna go on to the C. So, the, so C, remember, not so much a focus on, on interactions and people, but more on facts and details and information. Very close. <laughs> Very close. Yes, the other one. The other one. You got it. Bonus. C-3PO. Okay. And I mean, obviously, we're having a little bit of fun with that. We're taking that to an extreme. But I feel like it's just a funny example, and it helps It helps the points kind of resonate a little bit, right? Okay. One more. Let's just do this for fun. What do we think? So start, what I would suggest is you start with the easier ones to speed read that we were talking about, right? So think about the people that are having the very obvious demonstrative behavior. So who do we think is the person that had lots of hand motions, body movements, was charismatic? Did we watch, did sure, we watch no, Seinfeld? Kramer. Kramer, exactly. So Kramer for sure is the high eye there. And then, and then, I mean, not to give it away, but I did say to you, who's sort of always the, the steady, predictable one on the shows are always usually the stars. So that would be Jerry. And then, so the person that would be sort of opinionated, direct, letting you know, who do we think that is? I mean, I, this is a tough one. I, people have given me both, but in this case, it's Elaine. And so if you think of Elaine with, do you remember how she used to do that thing and 
she kind of do that get out she kind of like shout you know shoved the person and always had her causes and was very very you know on that about that and then george sort of by default george is the c um but you know it's funny if you watch any sitcom have a look and now you'll now that i've done it you'll be like oh victoria thanks for doing that because now you'll be able to watch them the same have a look at a sitcom that's got four characters and you will be able to pick them off d i s c that's what they're doing they want the four quadrants they want to have those different personalities interacting and intersecting and so you're going to see that and, and you'll, you know, like, so Will and Grace has a new, uh, they've revamped the Will and Grace. And so it's kind of the same thing. So Will is a good example in that one of the C. And, uh, and of course, uh, Jack, Crazy Jack, he's, he's like a good example of the I, Karen, totally the D, right? So uh, it's, it's fun. So you can, you, you watch and tell me, I've had people like message me the next day, Victoria, I was watching such and such last night. Now all I'm doing is profiling people. <laughs> And like that's okay that's good that's going to help with your communication patterns okay so we took this time to understand basically a little bit of disc and what it's about because i think it's really important that you understand that before we get into more of the specifics of roles on the team because a lot of the profiling and the positions and stuff that that i do is based on on people's disc profiles and you know great combinations and people who are kind of suited for roles more than other people. So let's have a look at this and see how that transfers. So this came up a little bit earlier about, about hiring. Um, and, uh, you know, I have, I, I am dealing with some teams that have, you know, a fair amount of teams that have hired and didn't profile anybody. And now we're dealing with a little bit of the fallout from that. Uh, I also deal with teams that are functioning very well, but just want to really communication because as you can see the communication is so key so what I'm going to do I'm going to just I'm going to mention these and then we are going to I'm going to go through each of them and uh, give you a little bit more context for that so this is what I see predominantly across the board as the biggest hiring mistakes okay hiring too soon number one <laughs> hiring without a job profile hiring based on feelings versus facts so now that you know a little bit about your factors, who would likely do that? Probably an I, right? Oh, we had a great chat. I can see us being BFFs. Great. When can you start? Happens more than you would think. Hiring only similar personalities or disc profiles as your own, thinking, well, this is how I am and I know how I operate. So yeah, sure. Okay. I need more of those. Hiring a really good candidate, but putting them in the wrong role. So putting them in a role that maybe is not their strength. And then hiring someone without an orientation strategy. So kind of hiring them and then kind of like throwing them into it and hands off and off you go, okay? So when is the right time to hire? So we, we talked about this a little bit in our introduction. And what I always tell people is, people say, oh, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, and I, you know, I hate paperwork and I hate doing this. And okay, that's great. But I always say, don't confuse being busy with being profitable big, big difference, right? So of course, paperwork is a necessity. It's part of life. It's something that has to be done. But really, it is busy work. It has to be done. But that's what it is. It's not income generating work. So I always really want to make a big distinction here. And that's the rule of thumb in this industry. You hire only when you find, okay, I'm not following up on my leads. I can't keep up on my leads. And I'm not able to generate new leads. That's the point where you're like, okay, now I need an assistant. Any of you follow Buffini? He will, yep, he will always tell you this too. A lot of people, oh, I, oh, I need to say, oh, I'm busy. I have all this paperwork. I'm gonna, yeah, but uh, what are you busy with? And only when you now realize, wait, I think I'm losing business because of how busy I am. I had this call come in. I couldn't respond. I couldn't follow up. I don't spend part of my day or part of my week on on promoting myself because that's another thing. You know, you get caught up sometimes like oh, I've got to send this paperwork in and I've got to do that. And that's true. But if you're not devoting a certain amount of time every day or hours in the week to promoting your business, generating new leads for your business, you're not going to be growing your business. Okay. So that's a really, really big uh, distinction with that. So again, that's your priority as a salesperson. That is your number one priority. You're following up on those leads. You're servicing your clients. You're trying to get more leads. Only when you can't do that is when you need to. And as we talked, very good stuff. The, the first hire is typically an administrative assistant. Some people kind of try to jump right to a buyer's agent. Ideally, I would say you do the admin assistant first, and then the next thing would probably be to add another buyer's agent once you're at the point 
and your admin is busy and doing everything, you're servicing the leads and you're still having more leads coming in, that's when you would go to a buyer's agent. Okay, so job profiling. So this is really, really key and it's gonna sound basic and almost silly if people don't do it, but you would be surprised how many people hire and they haven't really, they don't really know what they're hiring for. They haven't just decided like, oh, I think I need some help. Okay, let's go. So you gotta be strategic about this. You're building your team. Think about it. This is your business, your team. You're building your team. You've gotta be really strategic about this. So what you need to do is you need to have a job description. You need to be like, okay, what is this person doing? Um, what do I want from this person? And, you know, it's, it's, it's very much um, a matter of putting the right person in the right role. So what I say is you can't fill a role properly if you don't know what the role entails yourself. So if you don't really know, think about that poor person. So job profiling establishes the skills and behaviors that the job requires, okay? So with my company, I have these ones. These are already preset. So I've got, I've got job profiles for an admin assistant, a buyer's agent, a listing agent, a team leader, and a team manager, just to name some. I also do customized profiles. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll work with the client. And, um, you know, so a recent example of this is somebody um, was hiring someone for their team. It's a very, very large team. So this wouldn't apply to everybody. But they kind of, they wanted to hire a team manager slash recruiter to be looking out to maybe hire more people. And, and so that was kind of a hybrid description because it wasn't this one or this one. And uh, so I'm able to do that. I'm able to work with the person. We talk about, okay, what kinds of things do you see that person doing? And then we're able to come up together with a profile. Okay, and so what that is, is like I said, it starts with a description. You know, you, you know what you need. So, oh, I need somebody to prepare my CMAs and I need somebody to, you know, uh, follow up on this or handle the thin track paperwork or that kind of thing. And then what we do is we look at the behaviors that drive that, that will be good at that skill. So I can tell you, you know, I know what these ideal profiles look like. Again, there are people you don't have to have it specifically uh, always that way. People bring different things to the table, but these are really a good bet to getting going. So this is just a, a little snapshot of a, a profile. And what I'm going to do, I have some of these, I have a sample copy of these printed off. So I'm going to pass them around. So if you want to just take a look at it while I'm talking, that's fine. So what this is, is these are different profiles and it, it's going to show you what that looks like. So it's going to talk about you know, the behaviors that go into that role. So here, here's what a, what a profile for your, for an admin, let's say a typical profile for an admin assistant would look like this. Again, it doesn't mean it has to be completely like that, but looking at this is something that you kind of have a guideline and you strive for. So in this, talking about what we already talked about, we're looking at high S followed by high C, and then we see that the I and the D are below the line. So this is the factor this, this line here is where we where we determine what the high factors are and what the low factors are. So if you're ever looking at the graphs, that's what that's about, okay? So your highest factor up there. And also, so you know, the higher up the line it goes, the more um, extreme the behavior is and same with the lower. <laughs> so this kind of makes sense, right? What I was talking about. So with someone being your, um, you know, either administrative assistant or your client care coordinator, you know, having somebody with, with a high S, so somebody who's very steady, who likes to follow through, you're gonna want that. Somebody who's compliant, very good on details. Uh, again, very important. You don't want uh, somebody who's throwing rules aside and saying, ah, I'll figure it out, I'll do it by myself. You don't, you, don't, you don't necessarily want that in that role. Again, maybe it's a hybrid role and you don't mind that. That's why I personalize them because some people are looking for different, different sets of behaviors for that. And so what this will do, this is just one page of it, but as you'll see the report as it's coming around, it talks to you about, okay, here's what you're looking for. And it, 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 it'll indicate each of these factors and what that factor brings to the job. And you have that profile set so that the great thing is that then when you're interviewing people, and I wouldn't suggest that you do this for everybody, but only with serious candidates, uh, the ideal time would be between interview one and interview two. So you've talked to them, you've had a, kind of a good chat, you feel like things are going well. At that point, when you're bringing them in for a second interview would be the ideal time to have them do a disc assessment for a couple of reasons. One of the great benefits is you actually get a list of personalized questions to that person's profile, which is brilliant because 
you know, somebody might say to you, oh, yeah, I'm really, really detail-oriented, and they can talk up a good game or something, and then, like, you look, and, like, you know, there's these down here, and you're like, mm. But it, the nice thing is these questions will actually give you kind of a delicate way to probe that without it coming across and, and really being able to get into some stuff that you probably wouldn't be able to come up with yourself. So it's really great for that. And then the other thing is you can match it up to see how close of a match is the person to your profile. So I have had people hire people on a two-star, two-star match. It's a one to five-star rating system, but I'll tell you why that happened and the great thing about having that happen. It was the person who was looking for a recruiter slash manager. And what happened was when they got the job profile back, they saw that the person was really high in eyes. So really, really great at talking, at connecting, and didn't really have the high S, didn't have that kind of listening, that kind of follow through. And so what he decided to do was have that person focus exclusively on recruiting and then was able to have the managing part go to somebody else who was needing to have something else done. And because he knew exactly what he was getting, he was able to actually tailor the job to her. So that's the whole other thing, right? Is knowing what you're getting, having the expectations set up. So they were able to do that based on that, ex that experiment. So I touched on this briefly, but you know, take the guesswork out of hiring. Like it, you know, it's one of those things where based on what we talked about, like who do you think is going to interview? Great. The high eyes, right? The high I and a high D probably too. They're going to walk in and they're they're going to own it. They're going to they're going to be talking to you. They're going to be engaging with you, and they'll say the right things. Especially D's. D's are brilliant at saying things confidently and assuredly, even if they don't know. So my husband is a, is a super high D. And I mean, honestly, for people who don't know him, I'll have to warn them when they're, they're nodding, going, really? Oh, is that right? And I'll be like, hold on. He is just pulling that out of his butt, trust me. Like, he can say something very confidently and have no information to back it up, and he can say it. And it's like, okay. So Ds are great at that. You say something, yeah, oh, I'll do that. I absolutely, I'll take on that challenge, and I'll do And And so you're like, great. Well, Thing is we're taking off the blinders now we've, we have the tools to actually look and be like okay is this really happening so again high eyes are going to walk in and they're going to rock any interview that they're in they just are but that doesn't mean that they're suited to the role so you have this person they're great oh my gosh okay we got along great they're high look at them they're this but maybe they're not suited for that role on the opposite end high c's often don't interview well you know if you remember some of that body language we saw there's a lot of you know, like note taking or whatever. So they might be focused on, I got to ask the right questions. I got to listen to this. I got to, so that might not project very well. That could come across like, oh, what's up with that person? You know, maybe they're standoffish or aloof. High C's often get accused of being uh, aloof and standoffish. And it's mostly just kind of their concentration phase. They're just kind of taking everything in. But I mean, ironically, high C's, we talked about their words and what they're like. They're often